Alec, as an electrician, what's it like working for a cameraman like Chris Menges? Very demanding. Uh, I think you can say, well, in my mind, Chris is the best. Yeah. Not Alec, best. you've got to come and work some magic. Okay. Come back late. Uh, not in Britain, but in the world, so... You better go and work your magic, You better go and do that. that. Yeah. <laughs> Earlier this year, Chris Mingus won the Oscar for Best Cinematography for the film The Killing Fields. Typically, Mingus didn't turn up in Hollywood to collect his Academy Award, even though it represents a pinnacle of achievement for his work in cinema and in television. He was probably too busy working. Since the early 70s, Mingus has become one of Britain's greatest lighting cameramen. Recently, he's brought his highly distinctive naturalistic style to a partnership with the director Bill Forsyth, here on Comfort and Joy, Forsyth's latest film. But before that, they worked together on a local hero on location in Houston, Texas. If you face, if you're facing slightly that way there, let's walk slightly in that direction. I think we had a good time making the local hero. And uh, uh, it was actually only after the film was finished and I had uh, watched it a couple of times with an audience that I realized how much visual quality was there uh, because Having, you know, made films in Scotland for a long while and thought that I'd seen everything that Scotland could produce on film, um, I was quite amazed to see the amount of things that Chris had created. And it wasn't just a matter of filming things. He, there was actually atmospheres, you know, visual atmospheres that were created uh, in the film. Uh, and <coughs> by, you know, by him using his skill, it wasn't just a matter of putting the camera on the beach and filming it. There was lots of things going on with filters and nets and and overexposing and underexposing things which I was completely unaware of until I saw the film, you know, so I was just as astonished to, as, as any member of the audience with the quality of it. Mostly he terrified me because uh, mostly, uh, according to my eyes, we would be in a situation where we couldn't film anymore because it was too dark. The thing is, whatever we do, I'm afraid we're going to have to do really quickly because it's going right. to shut down in 15 minutes. Right. right. Can you organise the what extras you want? Uh, and he would keep persevering and say, well, we can do another take and another take. And uh, So I was quite terrified of what to expect when the rushes came back. But, but uh, obviously his eye was seeing, you know, what we were filming in a completely different way. And uh, he just seems to understand what, you know, he seems to understand, apart from anything, uh, the, the creative thing that happens on top of a very sound knowledge of film, he seems to understand just what the emotion can take, you know, and uh, to a very kind of critical degree. As I say, sometimes I would just be completely despairing of getting anything, and then when you see the rushes, there are colours and, you know, light coming out of everywhere in the shot. You know? So you feel you learned a lot from him? Um, in the sense of... Uh, um, I, I, didn't, I, I still don't know how he does it, so in that sense I haven't learned anything. But I now know that there's a whole area of, of, of image uh, uh, gathering in a film that, uh, that is a cameraman's area. In, the, in a sense, as a director, you, 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 if you find someone like Chris to work with, then you just count your blessings. Now you've brought him to urban Scotland, to Glasgow, to your hometown. Do you think he'll be able to deal with that in as interesting a way? 
Well, the thing about uh, Scotland is it doesn't matter whether you're you're on a beach in, in the northwest or, or in Glasgow, the the actual quality of the light is pretty much the same because we get the same clouds, the same weather, the same amount of moisture in the atmosphere. So all these things are in Glasgow, and uh, the fact is in this film we, we we've we've also chosen the same kind of atmosphere to recreate, and that is kind of dusk and and dawn. Most of the movie happens in twilight, either morning twilight or evening twilight. Um, in fact, I think there are only about three or four scenes that happen in daylight. So we're really in the same situation as we were in Local Hero, just um, trying to pin down about an hour's worth of uh, light quality per day. So it's the same, really the same uh, same problem. You know, we hang about for a couple of hours and then say, oh, all right, do it now. <laughs> Not only film directors value Chris Mingy's talent, Actors too have an appreciation of his work. Bill Patterson is the star of Comfort and Joy. And listen, everybody, one day soon I'm going to tell you all about this, perhaps even in a very special program, but until then, I'm a man of mystery. So that's all from your old pal, the early worm, until tomorrow morning. Bye-bye from Dickie Birdie. Tweedly tweet tweet. He plays a Glasgow disc jockey, and even in what seems like a simple sequence sitting at the studio console, Bill Patterson feels that his performance is heightened by Mingy's attention to detail. Uh, I've not done so many big feature films. It, um, up until recently, I thought that the cameraman just operated the camera. You know, I didn't think that the lighting cameraman was the the, the moulder of the light, almost like kind of sculptural with the light. Uh, and to be working with somebody who, when you see the results, as I have seen his films over the years. Uh, to actually see how that's done is, is extraordinary. And he's, he's such a quiet man, Chris, in his way of working away. He just sort of magic little things appear, funny little bits of little bubbles of light are fitted in here, wee bits of plastic appear with a light in them, and bits and pieces of polythene and tape. And the whole film's made up of tape, I think. You know? And he just seems to mould all that into something that when you eventually see it, it's just, you think, oh, that's what he was doing it for. I think he thinks more about me than almost uh, my performance more than almost anybody I've worked with. Yeah, he's always uh, concerned about is it how is it for you? Will that be? Uh, well, I'm trying to do this for that. Yes. Although he's quiet about it, he doesn't say it all the time. But yeah. So that you are aware of why he's doing particular things with the lights. It doesn't kind of leave you in ignorance. No, well, I wouldn't say. I mean, if I asked him, he would say. But he's, he just gets on with it. I started off, you know, like cleaning boots and making tea, then being assistant editor, then being assistant cameraman, and doing lots of jobs in between, right on the fringe, just at, at the very, very end of free cinema. It was the film that we were involved with at that time was called March to Audemarsen. You remember the Audemarsen marches? And then I went to work for World in Action, and it went on from there. Uh, an early film you worked on was called Raid into Tibet. Can you tell me a bit about that, Chris? How, how did it start? That was the first film I shot. Like, I was the cameraman, I was responsible. And before that, I'd been working for World in Action on programs where there was a lot of studio material. And three of us went, basically. Uh, we went up to, to Kathmandu, and then we went into the mountains. Um, without permission, and made contact, there were just three of us, with a group of Kumbo guerrillas. And we basically were making a film about their refugee problem since the invasion by China into Tibet. And we got to know very well a, a group of Kumbo guerrillas, who were people, indigenous people from Tibet, who were living in, on, on the right up in the mountains of Nepal. And we went with them across, across the border, you know, 20,000 feet, in, wearing sneakers and all that, you know, really not well prepared. We went right across, and they ambushed and uh, destroyed a, a Chinese convoy. We went, you know, we were on a, on a high mountain pass looking down on the road, and they were just fine shots, and they, without any sophisticated booby traps. They just shot with 303, they shot the drivers, drivers of the convoy trucks dead. And that was a pretty scary thing to be doing. 
and having not worked out why I was doing it or what I was doing there. All we could see were stationary trucks and bullets firing at someone hidden beneath. The back's empty, but a Kamba runs out to blast the Chinese underneath. There's a Chinese soldier. Though we can see him from our position, the Kambas can't because of the truck, just as we can't see the Chinese behind the trucks further up. The Kambas are desperate to get him, as he could radio to cut our retreat. But he gets to the river bank and slowly creeps away out of our arc of vision. Back at the trucks, the Kambas are still firing at a Chinese we can't see. We think this Kamba must have got someone, but all that we can actually see from our position is a tire punctured by his bullets. But then a Kamba we hadn't seen slowly staggers across the desert, almost under us. Immediately comes the signal for retreat and all the filming to stop. Did you learn anything from making that film, that little film? About life? Your work. About taking on a responsibility, yes, for, for what you were involved in. About actually working out whether that was the right film to have made. Actually working out what the moral position was of doing that particular film. And that, that was good for me, like, when I was in Vietnam and times like that. Or when I was in Burma, like, if you're with people who are mates and they're being shot or hurt. Um, and you, I'd been with them for a long time, and when those people got hurt, it hurt a lot. But at least I, I could experience that and not feel too bad about filming that because they were mates, you know, and they, 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 it wasn't an intrusion. In Vietnam all the time I felt like an intrusion. I was an outsider filming misery, Vietnamese misery, American misery. Nobody, right in those days, in the 67, nobody, those soldiers didn't want to fight in Vietnam. They did not know why they were, they, they were there. Right, as soon as you to know and I went there because the guys that asked me to go were good. You know, they were they were up to do something serious. And the danger aspect of it is something that's not to be appreciated. I'm not My children, they're so, you know, they say, oh daddy you've done this and daddy you saw it. and then he was killed and daddy you did that and daddy you did this and I said you know shut up guys. It's not like that at all, you know. And they've just got a bad view, you know, from television of what Death and violence is all about because it's really horrible. The director, Ken Loach, struck up a relationship with Chris Mingis, and together they worked on their first film for the cinema. Called Kess, it told the story of a young lad who tamed and trained a hawk. Following their documentary instincts, Loach and Mingis selected a Yorkshire schoolboy who'd never acted before to play the lead. Kess proved so popular that the major distributors were forced to pick up a film they'd originally rejected. Yes, the new word to me. I don't know if I've ever before. Nobody, go on, line it up, man. Right, now tell us what the gist. Well, that land straps are attached to the bird's feet. And so I've got bird on the end, straps go down the end, then they swivel. Swivel, right down the board. 
Then you've got your leash. Leash on board? I fit it on my hand first. Then when it got to know me, I fit it on my glove. And after a while, I put it two inches away from its claws. And uh, like that, like. Right? Started to jump, for me eat. When it started to jump, I could move my hand away. Oh yeah, that's how we can see. Could move me underway, like. Um, I'd, I'd worked with Chris on another film, and um, I, in which he'd been the operator, and I'd been very impressed by his quiet sympathy for people, and we we talked quite a lot on that, and uh, he seemed to have the kind of experience that uh, that I was looking for. Um, he was quite good at improvising in a situation, and um, so we we got together on it. Do you feel that he taught you anything when you were working on Cass, particularly about composition, I'm thinking? Um, yes, I, I think Chris's um, qualities as a cameraman are to do with the way he sees light and to do with the way he composes the frame. Um, I, I think I've learned more from him about light than anything, just to, to look at light and see how it falls naturally and to see how it can present people in a sympathetic way and um, he has a feeling for light i mean most people actually you don't tend not to look at lights um, particularly um, very often lighting cameramen or people who like studios um, i mean this light that we're in now is uh, is very much a studio light but it's a very hostile light to be in i mean you've got a spot up there that's really hitting your eyes and now if you're working with somebody who hasn't um, been in a film before or even if they have, you want to arrange the light so that it doesn't um, impinge on them, so that it doesn't distract them. And Chris uh, is very good at this. I mean, he'll light perhaps from outside the window so that it, it's a soft, gentle light that uh, you don't notice when you've been filming for a few minutes. Now, there's no way you can forget that light. And uh, so it, it's his, his feeling for light is actually related to his feeling for people. And um, because he has a a kind of warmth, uh, a warm appreciation of people. He then finds a light that is sympathetic to them and that doesn't uh, intrude on them. You see, Ken's like a good director because he, like, he tells you what he wants. And then all you've got to do is be really smart, incredibly fast, and thinking, and you can give it. And it's much harder when you work with a director and you're not actually sure what he wants. If you're not sure what he wants, you can't make magic you can't you know catch that decisive thing so literally direction is what you want you want to know exactly what you can do no, not like that i just want him to chat away and you know drink cups of tea and <laughs> and let me know you know because if he says it like straight i won't i need to work in with what he's thinking i mean it's like having a relationship with a person isn't it you need some you, you know trust and confidence and like if someone walked in and said, do that, do this and do the other, I'd sort of do it, but, you know. I never forget once I was doing a film in America about a police force, and we arrived at the house, and it was about a black family, and it was really, it was about a legal point and how the family were interacting, right? And the family were way spread out with a garden in front, a garden in the back, and all in the middle. And I had no con way of conceiving how to find what I needed to do. And I could get nothing from the director about what, what, he, what we should make so that in three shots we could say it really simply and properly and well, you know? And I said to, to my assistant, I said, what shall I do? And he said, hose pipe it. So what the hell does that mean? He says, pick the camera up and walk through every room, backwards and forwards, so I went in and out. And I did it because I didn't know what to do. So I need that. You worked a lot in the 70s with Stephen Frears, mm. um, talking of friends. Yeah. And, uh, talking of friends. <laughs> um, and you made a lot of television with him, or a yeah. fair amount of television. There's one particular film which I watched called Bloody Kids, yeah. which you made for Central. Yeah. There's an opening shot in that film. Yeah. Can you take us through it and how you did it? I'm not sure I really wanted to do that shot anyhow. It's, it was a funny beginning. Stop protecting yourself. Don't I'm not. It. No, I just like, 
It was really cold, it was incredibly windy. I mean, it was like the wind, and it was right on the seafront, and the wind and the rain was cutting through everybody. It meant that every lamp you put up was going to swing, right? That blonde there, or whatever. It would be flying all over the place, and like, you've only got four sparks, right? Everyone's really grumpy because it's a night shoot, and it's really bitterly cold. You could not keep warm, no matter what you wore. And it was just a question of really, sort of bodging through it all and uh, deciding, well, if it, everything's going to blow, then try and use Benjamin shades and let them swing in the wind and let it all get a bit kind of dark because that's how it felt. And we just sandbagged every lamp we could and we just fought, literally fought the, the, the conditions until the screaming of the first assistant became, I, you know, that's part of the skill, came sharp enough for me to say, right, this is it. And of course it wasn't it. But that's part of the responsibility too, actually, when it's up against the wall, you do it. And if you can do that, you're okay. What did you shoot off when you were doing that shot? Um, I don't remember, I think it was an Elimac or it was uh, some crane. I thought it was a Citroen. No. Oh, that one was, yes, it was on the Citroen. Yeah. I mean, it, that became quickly a very useful tool if you, want to, if you want to track down a pavement and it's all uneven and you haven't got time, and if you lay the tracks, you may have laid it in the wrong place because somebody might change something or you might want to. Citroen's great because you can actually just run it down the pavement and adjust. It won't turn around bends, but you can adjust very fast. And so you can be quite creative. It's a very long shot. Yeah. It almost looks uncuttable. Yeah, it, I'm sure it is. In fact, in places it went so black that they jump cut the neck, so it was cuttable, thanks to my inadequacy. Let's talk a bit about working with Stephen Frears. What sort of a director is he compared with the others that you've worked with? What's he like? Stephen is... Um, He's, he's just great, you know, and I mean, he's like, he can be, he can be quite fiery with me and I can be, you know, but he's extremely creative and he's really caring and he loves to make kind of raunchy little films like thrillers almost and they say something. Well, it's a very, very complicated relationship. I mean, appallingly complicated. And we've done five films together, so presumably there's something that we both get from it. Um, Chris is an extremely emotional man, and I'm an extremely emotional man, and we get entwined in the most appalling way. Um, it's also that the films we make, they, ha they are like sort of journeys into the unknown. I think that's probably quite... Well, unconsciously, that's probably quite deliberate on my part, that I won't commit myself because I'm more interested to find out what happens. I can see that it makes it a nightmare for him, but he equally enjoys sort of discovering the whole time. Well, within the system which says, you know, everyone, people are always saying, what do you want from this scene? What do you want? What do you want this to happen? You say, well, I don't know. I mean, I want to know what happens, and I'll, I'll tell you when I see it. So if you're... If you're temperamentally the sort of person who likes to stand back and actually observe what happens and egg people on in certain ways or influence them in certain ways, then you're bound to enjoy a certain amount of chaos. And um, I'm sure the films we make are very chaotic and that people have to put up with us. So it's, when we work together, it's very stormy, um, atrociously stormy. I mean, I'm embarrassed to think of what we've both done. Um, I mean, I'd like to think that some good had come out of it. Um, and I'd like to think that we could both journey on into calmer waters. Because he comes from a realistic tr tradition, so he uses original light. So in that sense, he gets everything right. I mean, when he photographs, the world that he photographs looks like the world that I see. And a film like Bloody Kids, what I really remember, because in fact it wasn't a script, that I remember very early on in the shooting, losing all my faith in the script, but we'd cast it extremely well. And the boys, the kids running around the streets, they just looked very, very believable. So he gets it right, or in my eyes, he sees the world as I see it. He also has developed recently 
um, an immense theatricality, an immense sense of sort of flair and dramatic lighting. So those elements, you know, they're, they're what I gravitate towards. So in that sense, I know Chris well enough that I know he's going to go for those effects. That doesn't mean that he, do, he won't do something very delicate and sensitive at the same time. Now, if, if you walk in, if he shoots something, and you, uh, we're going to shoot a room, scene in a room, you know he'll head for the window because that's where the light comes from. So you actually, after a time, give up setting the scene anywhere else because you know that he'll say, but the light's coming through the window. How could I set it 15 feet away from the window when he's coming in there? So you learn how to do that, and it's not worth arguing about that. But in that, but I mean, I've known him, so I can't shoot in rooms, restaurants. He won't, he hates shooting in restaurants. And he's very, um, tyrannical and prima donnerish about it and quite capable of bullying you into not getting his way or 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 else he'll do it and, you know it's, i mean that's just part of the struggle night shooting is really expensive okay and a lot of bloody kids took place at night and as this part's stv will well know that i'm prone to using quite a lot of funny little bits of light and the reason to do it is simply because it has a natural source so it can be very near the actors, right? It gives you plenty of exposure. You haven't got to run out a million miles of cable, right? You haven't got a wind or a rain problem like in South End. And you can work incredibly fast. And you can actually pre-light before you arrive. And the problem with conventional lighting often is, is that you have to set it all up in the daytime, but you actually can, it's quite difficult to anticipate what the result is going to be till night comes. And by using a lot of practical lights, you can actually work it so that you can very quickly turn things off. You haven't got huge cables to drag away, lamps to move, people swearing. See that? That camera right there? If you're going over four miles an hour, they're meant to clob you. With everything they've got, all of a sudden there's squad cars surrounding you everywhere. Hmm. Should we try and beat the camera? Set in the damp streets of Glasgow in the 1960s, Sense of Freedom was produced by Jeremy Isaacs for Scottish television. It deals with the early life of convicted murderer Jimmy Boyle, and it was a subject which attracted Chris Mingis, whose talents were immediately recognised by Isaacs. He works in actuality situations. Sometimes he captures... You, you feel he's actually part of the action, and you're observing it from very close up. But he also has, I think, a very real ability to light for atmosphere. Uh, he, he has a gift, I think, in a sense of freedom. You see it not just... He gets by with minimum light, and that means not just that the thing is, is realistic, but that it has a kind of atmosphere, a kind of tension, a kind of expectancy, you know, sort of lights burning dimly in a basically dark thing that gives the thing a great atmosphere of excitement um, and you see it also in the interior scenes of the sense of freedom where 
Um, he manages to make life in a prison cell look consistently visually interesting, not by any gimmick, but just by the simplicity of what he, what he puts on the, on the celluloid. Uh, and that's the first and foremost thing you need from a cameraman. Secondly, as I say, he brings a great sympathy to the subject. He wants to know what the director's on about. He wants to know what the story's on about. And he works best when he feels involved. And that's good for the actors in the case of a fictional film. And it's good for the humanity, really, of what has succeeded in being filmed. And the third thing is um, that he works amazingly quickly. He won't be hurried, and yet, he always has the time to, to g get it, even when there's very little time available. One of the most extraordinary shots that I've ever seen uh, on the screen, let alone had anything myself to do with, uh, is a sort of tracking shot that he did um, uh, in a sense of freedom, when, when Boyle is walking down the street, greeting his mother, uh, giving the kids sixpence to buy sweets, um, and calling down Jada to come off with them to get on with this uh, fight they're on about. And now that was done almost as an afterthought at the end of a long day where we'd got nowhere owing to the, either our own incompetence or the machinations of Glasgow Council at some other part of the city. We couldn't get anywhere. And, the, and rather than write the day off, we decided to go across town and set up this shot, which McK John Mackenzie and Chris had wrecked. And they knocked that off as the dusk was coming in. I think they got it first take, and yet if you look at it, you will see that the timing of that shot is brilliant. It is a brilliantly orchestrated piece of photography. Now, a fellow who can do that, and a fellow who can do that first off, and then turn around to you and say, I got that, he's a good cameraman to have. Oh, come on, Jim. Oh, come on. All right, <laughs> Yeah, when he grows up, Mrs. Dogerty, he's gonna hit you back. Oh, listen, son, the day that wee shite hits me back, we'll collect the insurance on him. <laughs> Make it soon, eh? I'm still single. Uh, that's me, anyway, anyway. Aye. I'll see you later. Hey, uh, they may have a trouble now, son. Hello, eh? Oh, well. I was asking for the money. See ya. Here. Now, you want me to school with you, sorry. Talking out again. That's all good. Thanks, Jenny. Right. Let's go get a result after this morning. You also made water for Channel 4. In fact, it was the thing that Channel 4 kicked off with. And you made that with Stephen Frears. Was that another horror movie? Yeah, it was another horror movie. And have you read the book? No. It's great. You must read it. You really must. And we did the film, and it was a little bit of a horror film. But we had games. We got the steady cam out, and I was able to operate it. And I learned something really pretty smart on it about the camera and actors, and that was really good. What, what is a steady cam? Can you explain? It's, it's um, a hydraulic floating camera, which is quite heavy. Shooting handheld is good, good because you can move very fast and you can lay back very easily. You don't have very little equipment. But you have one problem is, is that you can't see behind you. And no matter whether or not you have an assistant who's sort of guiding you, he can't get it right because it's all to do with balance. 
And, but it's important because that's how you capture, that's how I caught East 103rd Street. It was 99% handheld, well, 90%. <laughs> but what the steady cam do, which I, I didn't, hadn't anticipated, because you have a monitor down here, a television monitor, and you have the camera up here, and you're weighing this quite heavy thing, you can actually see both sides of you. So you can actually move more, dance more. And it does something else really quite interesting because the image on the monitor, which is quite small, is not a graphic image. It is not an etched ground glass graphic image. It means that you don't necessarily, well, I don't perceive shots in graphic imagery, right? And I don't know, please, if you don't understand what I'm saying, no, I but you do, right? Yeah. But it gave me complete freedom to frame and look at something or somebody, or the way somebody was responding, or the way their bodies were moving, or whatever the language, the sense, gave me much, a lot of freedom to actually shoot somehow more with them. Not so conscious that I was making a bad composition or bad lighting. You'd never look at the lighting. You'd just go down there and light it with a gaffer, and then that would be the end of it. You wouldn't fiddle with any lights. You'd just grab this camera, and you would move with these people. And it was a very enlightening experience. For example, Chris talks a great deal about um, freedom for the actor within the frame or freedom for the character. And anyway, it comes from a documentary tradition where you don't tell people what to do. Well, if you light things very dramatically, you depend on people hitting marks and doing this and doing that. And I remember Ian McKellen, who was giving this wonderful performance in Walter, I mean, at the same time, Chris was quite capable of seeing how good Ian was being and following Ian. At the same time, going bananas because Ian wouldn't hit the same marks on every take because he was inventing it every time. Um, so he's in this, that sense, he's caught in those contradictions and he's trying to resolve those contradictions the whole time, which is, of course, where the tension comes from and, and the excitement. Producers hate it because it's endless and very hard to cut and I absolutely appreciate the problem. But for somebody who's interested in operating, I thought, it was very enlightening. Can I go home, please? Yeah. This is your home now, Walter. Come on. I said you'd be all right, didn't I? I promised you. And you will be. You can't stay in that house. The council won't let you on your own. I happen to think this is a very nice place for someone like you. Now, come on. And the other important thing about Walter, perhaps the most important thing, was that it was a really good heart. It wanted to say something and fight out. So there were two big things for me on that. And it was difficult because we had to make two kind of really serious plays in, um, I think, six weeks. Now, that may sound like a lot of time, but that extra week doesn't half help in cooling it, you know, because there's that terrible thing about running into work the next day and actually just doing it, not having thought of what you're going to do. And actually halfway through the day, realizing you didn't think, so it doesn't add up. I sometimes think a difficult thing when you're making a film is to say, look, I just don't know, because there's so much information going around and so many, so many technical problems and things like that. And the difficult thing is to say, well, what do you mean? I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means, you know? And, and uh, I've just found that uh, working with Chris, it was, you could do that. As well as that, uh, I wanted to push the film in ways that were not um, normal, really, you know, to make it look like a fairy tale and to make it look very like a, all, have all the glitter and the strangeness of, that a musical might have, but it was actually a film about violence and killing. And, uh, I think we had to push things very hard, you know, very, you know, almost to the edge in that direction. And uh, I think uh, Chris, you know, he understood it so well that it worked out very well. Now, your film Angel was a film which had a fairy tale, ethereal quality about it, especially, especially at the beginning when Stephen Ray, who plays the um, saxophone player, the hero, is looking at a kind of tinkling Christmas tree. Yes. Now that's a, a long sequence. Can you can you take us through it? You must remember it. I yeah, I do. Yeah, yes. Um, it, it was, um, well, the, the point was that uh, the girl was to meet the young saxophone player outside the dance hall, but it had to be in an area that was masked off from the main hall because uh, they had to observe a killing and not be observed. 
So it had to be some feature in the landscape that hid them, really. And uh, what I had written was that there's a copse of trees around the dance hall. But if you've got to look for a dance hall with a copse of trees adjacent enough so you can see what's going on and so you can shoot it and all that sort of stuff, you could be looking for 10 years. So we had to move in these very large pipes, these, these um, big concrete pipes, which framed the people quite beautifully. And we angled them towards the hall, do you know, so you could actually see the whole sweep of the pipes themselves and the couple, and beyond that you could see the, uh, the dance hall and the murder that was happening. But uh, as well as that, they were a, a believable mask for the people themselves that hid them. So uh, well, really it's just a matter of getting the characters from the tree to the dance hall in the most imaginative way possible. This is what they taught you in convent school. You can't hear me, can you? You're beautiful. Did you hear that? Blow the hole if you like, lads, but leave me be. You were making payments. I, I was told to. Tell this to someone. <laughs> You've been a bad boy. I think it's very important to, to work on good television because people watch it. And I think it's very important to work with directors who, who really care about it. And, and I, I enjoy that, almost the combat of trying to do it and do it well. And there are things I like to say, too. And every now and then I creep off and do a film because I need to be free. I can't live, you know, within cinema or within television. I need to run away and see things and learn and be excited, you know. But you don't feel frustrated in the setup. I mean, making a film like East 103rd Street, for example, 
There's some kind of a release for you. That's where you can... It's great, you know, because it's like I've never been living in Spanish Harlem. And, and when we found that family, and it's like all good documentaries, it's 80% luck. really is, isn't it? When we found that family, it's like we had nothing in common. And they said, well, why not, you know? And it was a, a genuine feeling from them that they wanted to, they wanted to be to be with us and they were happy to let us know about their lives and they could see we weren't going to exploit them or hopefully not and they were prepared to say well, why not let's give it a whirl and that's for me I, I learned a lot everybody who worked on that film they learned so much you also let the people talk for themselves which is what I liked about it yeah and I tried you know I tried it's the last time I'll try I tried asking asking what you, I guess we would call structured questions and, and structured scenes. What, like this and, interview, you mean? Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and it was di a disaster. You couldn't learn anything because it was like I was going there with my idea. Now, you say this and tell me about this part of your life. And, and I had to cut them all out of the film because they didn't, um, they, were, they were somehow not real. And they smelt wrong. And then I cut the film like, I was real dumb, I cut the film for what I thought I was trying to say. And, and then again, it was kind of like confused. So I said, oh, damn all this. And I went, tore it all apart, and I went and cut it in chronological order. And it was great. And that's what I said all along to, to the lesson, was that if you can uh, capture those moments, it's like, Cartier Bresson said the decisive moment. I know it sounds really pretentious, but it does say what I'm th feeling anyhow. But if you can catch that moment, if you can catch those words, and if you can cut them in, in the order in which they were shot, and think very carefully about what they were trying to say to you, that is the natural flow, and it, it's the most exciting way to make a film. So I'm talking about your son, Mom. I never seen him do it. No, you never seen him. You probably seen him more times no, than once. No, they're gonna have my, my they're gonna have to cut my leg off at the end because he's turning black with the circulation. You want me to shoot up too much? What the fuck? You crazy? I'll kill you. Yeah, I, I, I think I should to try how it is. See if you people like it the same way. Maybe I might like it. What'd you like? Mm -hmm. Let me catch your jeans. Uh, I just do it the same way. He's, you don't see him doing it, even though you do see him doing it. He shoots up two or three times a day. And you don't see him at all, huh? No, he doesn't. Don't mind, don't cover him up. I'm not covering him up. He doesn't do it in my house anyway. Well, I'm gonna try it. See what he's like. Yeah? Uh, try it again. Oh, try it again. Well, I, I think his, his main attribute is, is his concern to be accurate and authentic and to, to go for the, for the central subject matter of what the shot is and not for um, the, the sort of uh, technical uh, peripheries. I mean, he's not mainly concerned with the, the finesse of the, the movement or the finesse of the lighting. He's mainly concerned with what is the shot about and what is the film about. When you work with cameramen of that sort of power and that sort of talent, that's what they show you. They just say, look, actually, we could create something really enormous here or, norm or extremely intense or extremely passionate or, but big. And... Um, I, th I would think that largely came from working with Chris. And of course, once you get the bug and once you get the feel of them, they are tremendously heady images. Uh, and for some reason, the films we've worked on or recently have always been very strong and quite shocking and startling. I think he's just, he, 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 never, gives, he never gives up in terms of, um, it's, it's based on a, on a desire to, to make things look natural um, and to heighten that naturalness but not to weaken it by any form of kind of uh, artificiality. So he, 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 he works ceaselessly to create a natural effect 
in a completely unnatural way. Um, but the end result is, is totally natural. And maybe even slightly heightened. It's maybe more real than, than, than real is, you know. But it's done in such a way that, um, that the nice thing about it is that it's complete craft because it's not, it's not just a matter of taking what's there, it's a matter of adding to and subtracting from the light that's there. But, but the total effect is to make it look actually more real than it was to begin with. It's quite an interesting thing. If you had to tell somebody what your job was, give them a description, a job description of what you did, what would you say? Me. You. Me on my own. And not all the people that do everything with me. On your passport, what would you say? It says, um, student, my passport. Thank you.